This episode is brought to you by Audible. Check out Audible's limited time holiday special by following the link below. We're going to try something new in this episode. I talk a lot about the problems of capitalism and the challenges we face. As important as that kind of analysis is, it can make socialists like me come off as very negative people. So in this video, I'm going to talk about what makes socialism a positive worldview, and suggest that you might already be a socialist and just not know it yet. Before we begin, let me ask one small favor of you, the viewer. If you're watching this in the US, there's a very high likelihood that you have a negative opinion of the word socialism. That's okay. If you want to go ahead and leave a thumbs down on this video, that's perfectly fine. I would just ask that you stick around till the end. You might change your mind. And even if you don't, you'll at least have a better understanding of what socialism actually means than if you just hear the term misused on TV. I'll include a bunch of resources and further reading in the description if you're interested in learning more. As one final disclaimer to my friends on the left, I'm using the term socialism very broadly here, as a sort of catch-all for generally leftist thought. This episode is more for the people who are interested in learning what distinguishes the left from typical American capitalist perspectives. So, with all that in mind, let's get started. I think we should start with the distinction between liberals and the left. This is something that trips up a lot of people, and it doesn't help that the media seems to use the two terms interchangeably. Let's start with what the two camps have in common. Both leftists and liberals care about democratic governance and believe in universal human rights. But liberals, contrary to what many conservative news figures will tell you, still put their faith in capitalist market-based economics. They believe that the problems in our capitalist society stem from corrupt individuals, and if we simply root out these bad actors and pursue incremental reform, the system can function properly. Leftists have a different perspective. They believe that the problems we face are inherent to capitalism, and that the system is functioning exactly how it's supposed to. The left sees the problems identified by liberals not as problems within capitalism, but as a byproduct of a properly functioning capitalist machine. Capitalism cannot solve the problems it creates because that would impede growth. So leftists believe that we need to move beyond capitalism in favor of a better system. One of the most important distinctions to make between liberals and the left is that the left is concerned primarily with materialism. That is, the material realities of people's lives. Let's take an example policy proposal. Student debt cancellation. For a liberal, canceling even $1,000 of debt would be a huge symbolic victory. For a socialist, the amount canceled and the total amount of indebtedness are less important than most people's more immediate concern, being able to pay the installment every month. The material reality for most students is the challenge of affording the monthly payment. If that challenge is not addressed, then the policy does not materially improve that person's life, and is therefore insufficient. Let's take another example, Medicare for All. This is a big one for the left because making healthcare free at the point of service would have an immediate and enormous material impact on the average person's life. If you can afford to go to the doctor, you could literally be extending your life by having access to the medicine you need. For liberals, they'd be happy with a program that kind of covers some people but only under certain circumstances, and private healthcare has to stay, of course. And then when they pass that bill, they consider it a huge victory. Same with race relations. The liberals are content to kneel in traditional African garb and paint Black Lives Matter over a street, but they fail to address any of the actual material concerns of the Black Lives Matter movement. That's the difference, symbolic victories versus actual material change. To the left, the most important thing is materially improving the lives of normal people. Okay, now you should have a better understanding of the whole left versus liberal thing. But just to refresh, liberals may genuinely care about people, but their policies do not adequately improve people's lives. They still want to operate under the capitalist system, and therefore are not part of the left. Let's take a minute to consider which of these worldviews is more appealing to you. I'd wager that most people are more concerned with their material realities than winning empty symbolic victories. You want to see tangible benefits to your own life and the lives of your neighbors. People have economic concerns, and they need to be addressed. We inherently understand this, that we need to look out for ourselves and each other, and that's a key pillar of socialism. I think there's a lot to be said for things we inherently understand. If you were to ask a seven-year-old what we should do about people who don't have a place to live, or enough food to eat, or the medicine they need to live, what do you think they'd say? They'd say we should give those people what they need. Humans are a social and altruistic species. We all start out with these morals, and then we're slowly indoctrinated into capitalism as we grow. And it's not like we couldn't afford more humanitarian policies. It would just mean corporations wouldn't make as much money, and that's a deal breaker under capitalism. Another key part of socialist ideology is democracy. Democracy is about as American as apple pie. We're always talking about how we have a strong democracy, how democracy is what makes our country great. 
And yet, our elected officials, both Democrats and Republicans, fight tooth and nail against expanding democracy. They're constantly making it harder to vote, or giving corporations more power over their workers, or refusing to acknowledge the rights of certain groups. Socialists want to expand democracy. We believe in the ability of the people to make decisions for themselves. We should be able to elect our officials directly, not let other people choose them for us. Our elections are unnecessarily complex, the electoral college is a silly system, and politics has become little more than a sporting event. Socialists want to give electoral power back to the people so we can directly vote for policies that would improve the lives of average people, not continue to enrich the already obscenely wealthy and powerful. We should have a say in how our workplaces are run, not be beholden to every counterproductive corporate initiative. If you've ever worked in retail, you know just how badly the stores are managed. Take Best Buy, for example. I used to work at Best Buy as a camera expert. My job description was to help people find the best camera to suit their needs. I was good at it. I love cameras and I know how to pick the best one for any application. But like any retail environment, the managers would swoop in, tell us how to do our jobs, and we'd end up with unhappy customers or feel horrible about ourselves for pressuring people to sign up for credit cards they don't need. Workers aren't stupid. We know how to run our departments better than the managers do. Socialists want to flatten labor hierarchies as much as possible and bring real democracy to the workplace. Workers should be able to elect their managers and should make up at least part of every company's board. We believe that the rights of all humans are universal, that we're all created equal, no matter the color of our skin or where we come from or our sex, gender, ability, or who we love. No one should be considered a second-class citizen because of some immutable characteristic. We believe everyone should truly get a fair shake, and there's nothing more American than that. Okay, that's all well and good, but don't socialists want to take away people's freedom and make us all poor? On the contrary, we believe that capitalism stands in the way of real freedom, and we want to fix that. Are you really free to live your life if you spend 10 or 12 hours a day working for someone else? If you don't have health insurance because your employer won't provide it and it's too expensive on the free market, are you really free to buy the medicine you need? Are you really free to buy a home if you're barely able to make rent? Sure, capitalism allows for the possibility of such things, but you're not really free to achieve them if the very system is hellbent on making them impossible to reach. Socialism addresses all of these concerns. In a more humane, post-capitalist society, all workers would make a fair wage and they would have control over many of the day-to-day -day operations of their workplaces. Their lives would be materially better because they'd make more money, feel like their work is more meaningful, and work more reasonable hours when profit is not the sole driving factor. Healthcare would be free and universal, so you wouldn't have to worry about getting sick and going bankrupt trying to pay your medical bills. Modest homes could be guaranteed to each family, with the option of buying a larger one if that's what's important to you. The point is, socialism aims to expand your freedom, not take it away. The people who claim socialism is trying to steal your freedom are the same people who have a vested interest in keeping capitalism around. They'd have to pay their workers a fair wage, and that's not in keeping with the capitalist goal of ever-increasing profits. Now, let's address the socialism makes everyone poor fallacy. There's an expression on the left that encapsulates the vision of wealth redistribution, from each according to their ability, to each according to their need. In short, those with more money contribute more, and those with less money contribute less, all for the benefit of everyone in society. Some people may not like this idea at first, but think of it like this. Have you ever been to a potluck? If not, it's a kind of communal meal where everyone contributes something. Someone with more disposable income might provide steaks or seafood. Someone who's a good baker might bring delicious homemade pies. If you don't have the means to bring anything big or expensive, you could always contribute a bag of chips, some soda, or paper plates. These are all things that people can use and will appreciate. The end result of everyone contributing something is a meal that is greater than any one person could have enjoyed themselves. It's fun, it's communal, and it makes everyone feel like a part of something great. This is the vision of wealth redistribution in a nutshell. Now, apply this to society at large. Beautiful public parks for everyone to enjoy. High-speed public transportation that will make commuting much less stressful and cut pollution. Libraries where anyone can borrow books or movies or take classes. State-of-the-art schools for our children. This is a vision of the world that is possible if we can move beyond the toxic greed of capitalism. Does this all sound like you? Do you believe we need to address the material concerns of average people? Do you believe that everyone is created equal? That we should expand democracy? That healthcare and a decent standard of living are basic human rights? That we should work together to build a better tomorrow for everyone? That we need to move beyond capitalism to ensure a livable future? If this does sound like you, congratulations, you're a socialist. Now, there are plenty of different perspectives within the left. Some advocate for a classless, moneyless society. Some for a form of market socialism. Some for a near-complete flattening of hierarchies. But what they all have in common is a belief in equality, dignity, and the value of human life. 
and that's something we should all agree upon. So come on in. We'll be glad to have you. This topic is so important to me. I try my best to understand and learn as much as I can so I can share with others. And one way I like to do that is by listening to audiobooks. I travel a lot for work, so I have plenty of time to sit on planes and listen to fascinating audiobooks on Audible. One great one that I recently listened to is Socialism Seriously by Danny Ketch. It's a great short listen, about five hours long, and it's a fantastic primer for those new to the left. It's funny, easy to understand, and it really does a great job of painting a picture of what life could be like if we just decided it was time to move beyond capitalism. Now is a great time to get into Audible because for a limited time, you can take advantage of their holiday offer and get your first six months of Audible Plus for just $4.95 a month. If you like to learn as much as I do, less than five bucks a month is an incredible deal. Audible Plus is a little different than what you're probably used to. Instead of getting one free audiobook per month, with Audible Plus, you get access to the entire library of thousands of audiobooks, podcasts, and originals included in the Plus catalog. And you can listen to as much as you want. Have 10 books you've been meaning to read? Sign up for Audible Plus and listen to all of them for just $4.95. I don't think I can accurately convey how much I love Audible. I struggle to sit down and read a book, but with Audible, I can get through all the titles I've wanted to, all while running errands or commuting or traveling for work. It's completely changed how I learn. If you enjoyed this week's video, I highly, highly recommend you check out Socialism Seriously on Audible. It's a fantastic listen. If you want to help support my channel so I can produce more content like this, visit audible.com slash second thought or text second thought, one word, to 500, 500 Sign up today and get your first six months of Audible Plus for just $4.95 a month. It really does help support me and my channel. Follow the link below or text second thought to 500, 500.